Hello, everybody. We are very, very sorry for the internet issues. At one o'clock exactly, the internet cut out. We're going to try now. Um, my name's Cam Jimmies. I'm also known as Royce Leville. And I will be reading today from this book, The Book of Names. My partner in crime is on the sofa with me. <laughs> they, Joseph can is, they can hear me through this one, I think. So. Okay, he's also known I'm, I'm as hoping, Musketeer. I'm hoping everybody can hear us. I'm hoping they can. Um, I'm pretty sure they can. Just, just let us know if you can't hear us. Um, yeah. If it looks like a silent film with voices, with mouth moving and no voices, then let us know. Yes. In the comments on Instagram now. Or on Facebook. No, not on Facebook. YouTube. YouTube. We are totally... Social media, internet, buffoons Got it down. today. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you all for watching. This is the third event in the Australian Artist in Germany series. Uh, last month, we had Tim McMillan. And all of the, the money so far has been donated to the Indigenous Literacy Foundation. And in the last two events, we've raised almost 500 euros already. So thank you to Tim and Rachel and also to Joel Javier who was in the first event in September. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to read one of my stories from Royce. I'm wearing the Roycing hat. And this is the hat that I actually wear when I write as Royce Laville. He's a kind of dark alter ego um, of my writing work. And I'm going to read one of the stories from the book. Uh, Joseph is going to play songs in between and... We are both not quite sure how this is going to go, but uh, hopefully, yeah. well. There was no sound on Instagram, so I just took the little cable out. So it's just going through my phone now. But uh, if you go to uh, YouTube on Ripple Media, how do you spell that? With what three P's. With three P's. <laughs> Ripple then, Media. Then you should get the full sound experience. Um, but otherwise, you will just hear us as normal yes this has been not a big success so far but <laughs> it does it does have the added bonus of um lowering the expectation of what's to come and when you lower the expectation you can normally be quite surprised if something is actually quite good so what we've done in the first five minutes is make a really really low bar and now it should be quite easy to reach something a bit higher true. very true <laughs> very true <laughs> Um, should I should actually? Uh, this is another technical detail. Sorry, Royce, but do you think we could check whether the sound on YouTube is working with your phone? We probably could. We probably should do that because if it's if it's not Bear working, it's probably we probably should. Probably could. We probably should do that. Okay, it's working. It's Perfect. Us. We did it. We are... We've graduated to class two yes. of the internet and social media. <laughs> All right. Lucky us. So, it's fair warning. Things are going to get a little bit dark. So, the story is quite... Well, it's not, it's not violent, but it implies a lot. Um, it can be a bit dirty at times. I'll try to keep it clean. I'll try to keep the swear words out so that we can uh, get past the senses. But uh, <laughs> these events are all for charity. So if you do like them and do enjoy them and have watched the ones before and will watch the ones in the coming months as well, please donate. Uh, the link is in the, the YouTube um, description to the Indigenous Literacy Foundation and all money is greatly used. Yes, money for books. So I think, I think we'll just start. Yeah, what do you reckon? Let's do it. I'm ready. Actually, I'm not ready because I need to... Uh... <laughs> the Book of Names is an unusual collection. Um, it's 20 stories and each story is basically... Well, not basically. It is just a name. That's the title of the story. Um, some of them have, you know, that name is the main character or that, that name is someone who's an influential character. Um, the story I'm going to read today is has a character who is a very influential character and... Uh, had some interesting feedback to this story over the years. 
And this book won an award a couple of years ago as well. So I'm quite proud of that. So, Joseph, comfortable? Comfy. I think we're just about 1.5 metres apart, <laughs> are we? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> well, don't get out of the shot. <laughs> All right. Brace yourselves. We're going to begin. Willard. Basements are useful, he says. You can escape from the world. It was supposed to sound romantic and deep, as if down in his basement is some kind of lavish studio where he paints massive murals and carves driftwood into sculptures. A place where he records albums on which he plays all the instruments. Scatter cushions, homemade candles, racks of wine, the bench seat from an old car turned into a sofa, a pottery wheel and kiln, a kind of temple to bohemian endeavour that would make any girl swoon, even this restrained software sales rep. True, it's a studio of sorts, but probably not the kind that would satisfy this girl, because that basement comment, in response to her hobbies and interests line of questioning, has her looking at him like he's a total weirdo. She's seeing a very different kind of basement, some dank cave where a girl gets locked away. Are you into model trains or something? She asks. She sips her red wine using both hands to hold the glass as if she's taking communion. She's got small, slender fingers, the nails trimmed to the tips and very thin arms. Desk hands, he decides. They never felt the sting of a hot spark flying off a grinder. Never got dry enough for oil to seep into the cracks and stay there. He'd like to be honest, to tell her about the precision cutter and the high-speed grinder, his art and its use. He'd like to go into detail to prove his ability and knowledge, how it requires the steady hands of a surgeon and how any small mistake is costly. The walls deserve description, the catalogues and cards, the sublime orderliness of it all, the usefulness, his basement. There's nothing degenerate about it, nothing untoward. Sure, it has a lock, but he firmly believes every door should. He folds his arms, hiding his hands. No, no trains. Do you sleep down there? No, because you look pretty tired. She sips her wine again, her eyes moving briefly to the organiser. He follows her glance and sees the speed dating sergeant with a stop clock in her right hand and her left hand poised above that annoying little concierge bell. More precious seconds tick by. I work with metal, he says. It's my basement. It's art. Really? Yes. Is it worth anything? Depends on how you value it. She seems to find this interesting. Have you ever had, you know, an exhibition of your art? He nods. But most people are too caught up in their own worlds to recognise what they're seeing. She gives him a steady look. That last comment was clearly unexpected. I think I might want to see some of your stuff. My basement? The bell rings. All dates end and everyone stands up. That's the last session, session and the organiser is keen to send everyone home as it's already late. She collects the forms and goes through the routine. She blows out the candles and takes down the love heart balloons. People put on their coats. Those who came with friends leave together. Most of the men check their phones to signal a level of importance and disguise any apparent aloneness. As regular attendees, some of the men nod at each other before leaving. See you next week, Willard, the organiser says, hurting him towards the door. He watches the software sales rep, shot her her handbag. She doesn't dig in it for car keys. She suddenly looks rather young to him, a little lost. He waits, letting her leave, then follows Outside, he sees her walk to the bus stop. She has a strange, slow, duck-footed way of walking, as if one leg is weaker than the other. She walks on her heels, leaning slightly backwards. The stop is for the Q6, which goes out to the small community college on the outskirts of town. His vintage motorbike sidecar is parked around the back of the church's multi-purpose hall. He removes the wheel lock and places it in the sidecar's trunk. With his helmet on, he sits on the bike and waits. If, a stu if she's a student, he thinks, it means she lied. And that means she lied about everything. 
If she plays a role at speed dating, it means she's only herself at home. Research, an identity thief, sex without attachments, all possible. Her guard dropped when I talked about art. She was the most interesting. She was new. She was the only woman who didn't spend seven minutes trying to recall where we'd met before. The bus stop. The bus arrives at the stop, then pulls away. He follows at a distance, knowing the route. Thistles, the homeless at prayer. The wolves tread lightly, and the wolves tread fair as the snow the plains where the eel and the winds blow and out across the plains where the low shrubs grow can you hear the girls singing of the deer and the doe she sings for spring time Stomach's hungry. Ooh. And out across the plains comes a thunderous roar. Oh, the wood hearts they tremble as the sleet starts to fall. Can you hear the wolves howling? Can you hear the girl cry as the sky turns crimson red? The night is crisp and clear, the traffic light. As he rides, he peeks in the windows of the cars that pass. He recognises some of the drivers and passengers. With those he doesn't recognise, he wonders about their lives, their secrets, the roles they play, becoming a different person in every different room they enter, where they live and what kind of locks they have. How do they look when they sleep, when the barriers they put up during the day fall away? He's jealous of all those people have places to go and are impatient to get there. But he's glad for them. 
because he knows that distraction and purpose keep the demons at bay. The stop is the last one before the college. He parks the motorbike in the almost darkness, equidistant from two streetlights. Helmet off and wheel lock in place, he grabs his pick set from the sidecar's trunk and slinks among the shadows. Further down the street, she duck walks towards a gated apartment complex. She takes her keys from her coat pocket and opens the gate. He's got the key to this gate, but it's at home, in the basement. When the gate clangs shut, he walks up to it. Through the bars, he watches her enter House B of the complex. He's got the key to that too, to all the houses in, this, in the complex. He picks the lock and eases the gate shut so it doesn't clang. From the path, he sees the lights on the third floor come on. Front apartment, left side. He's soon through the ground floor door. The house has a locked basement. He picks that door as well. Once inside, he sits on an old wooden crate and removes his shoes. An hour passes. During that time, he doesn't hear anyone enter or leave the building. During that time, he could have gone home, but he likes it down here in the basement. It's quiet, surprisingly clean and dry. There are no rats, no water dripping. He closes his eyes. House B, third floor, front left side, Madeline Swain. He pictures a name written on the circular label at the base of the key. Yellow label, green pen. Everything was fine with her, just lonely. She slept without an expression, a large boxer at the foot of her bed. One shot of a tranquilizer kept the dog out for about three hours. When she slept on her right side, she snored ever so softly. She didn't appear to dream. She wore pyjamas and woolen socks. The silk sheets were a bit extravagant. She worked in marketing at the tourist office, rode a bicycle to work. Her alarm was set for 7, 10 a.m. She liked to knit and do tapestry, which bracketed her, bracketed her in an age group much older than she was. The apartment was littered with projects, both finished and unfinished. When her keys first went missing, she called him for help, said she'd found his business card pinned to the notice board next to the mailboxes downstairs. She wasn't distraught or panicking, more annoyed than anything else. He made the required copies from the keys she gave him and reproduced the less complex keys for which he had all the originals. He showed her the special pen-sized camera he had which could photograph the inside of locks, allowing him to make the suitable keys. She joked that with such a camera, a thief could break into any home, building or car. He assured her it only worked for very simple locks, like the cheap lock on her bicycle, and the right tools and software were needed to reproduce the keys. With all her keys replaced, she offered to make him a scarf. He refused. At one point, she called him a hero. She flirted too, but he guessed that was mostly out of gratitude. He suggested she get a dog, some energetic, lively breed that would require exercise and attention, hence the boxer. When he chanced upon her at speed dating, she didn't recognise him and spent their allocated seven minutes trying to place him. That was months ago. He opened his eyes. Madeline Swain was gone. The lock for her for house B, third floor, front left side has probably been chained. There's work to do. He picks up his shoes and climbs a three flight of stairs. The single lock is a cinch to pick. The chain easy to slide off with the door just slightly ajar. His hands are steady. The dangling chain makes no noise. Inside, there's a light on in the living room, a soft light. Perhaps a lamp, orange shaded. He edges inside and sniffs the air. It's musty from sleep. No pets. Rice for dinner, probably takeout. He finds her on the sofa, a red rug up to her chin, reading glasses slightly askew. Out of its ponytail, her hair is rather stringy. An open book is upside down on the floor, inches from where it fell from her left hand. Anthropology in the title, borrowed from the community college's library. There's no sign of male life, no evidence of a boyfriend. He creeps into the bathroom and sees only one toothbrush, the bristles splayed and well-worn. She uses anti-dandruff shampoo and coconut-scented face moisturiser. For half an hour, he stands over the sofa and watches her. She sleeps with something close to a grimace, appearing to grind her teeth. The temptation to pick her up and carry her to bed is strong. Turn off the lamp, Close the blinds, pick up the book, flatten the crease pages. He wants to right all the wrongs in this flat. 
he senses she needs help. Not lonely necessarily, but struggling. Money, he concludes. She seems very small bundled up on the sofa, helpless, innocent, unattractive in her sleep. He takes her keys from the hook near the door and leaves. Pulling off the chains from the bottom of her lungs. A three headed dog and his three burnt tongues. Pluto lining up with the earth and the sun. Drink it up now. Drink it all up. Now hear the moans and the howls of the bodies in the deep. So they kick and they tear each other in their sleep. You got one hand in the river, but for them she will weep. Drink it up now, drink it all up. And what more do you want, love? Oh, what more? And in a thrice plowed field of thrice sown grain you pour out the mice and you pour them out again you've tied it to a tree in the ash and the rain oh drink it up now drink it all And what more do you want, love? And what more do you want? And if the moon was made of gold would you burn or drag it to the depths of hell oh and if the moon was made of gold would you burn or drag it to the depths of hell and if the moon was made of gold you burn or drag it to the depths of hell and one more do you On the phone, she's panicking. They're all gone. I don't understand it. I left the apartment in such a rush this morning. Late for something, he asks. He moves to the corner of the basement to prevent the echo. For work, I just pulled the door shut like I always do. Happens a lot. Then I got home and I realized I didn't have my keys. So, are you locked out or did you lose your keys? Lost them. My landlord let me in to check. They're all gone. 
all of them. He takes the keys from his pocket and inspects them. On the key ring is a purple frog, rubbery and soft. Your business card says you're available 24 hours, she says. You can bring the keys to my shop tomorrow and I'll make the copies. Tomorrow? Or I can come over now and get them, do the work tonight. What would that cost? House calls are extra. I'm guessing your landlord needs his extra key back pretty soon. All three of them. The gate and the door downstairs. Again, he inspects the keys in his hand, wondering what locks they open. She doesn't have very many keys, just half a dozen. There's one very small bronze key, rounded with two teeth. He's curious about that one. And then there are the others. They were one-offs. Oh, I'm so screwed. Relax. I deal with this every day. You'll be fine. I think you better come over right now. Okay. As she gives him the address, he gathers up his gear. After a few more reassurances, she starts to calm down. Are you really the only locksmith in town? He stands in the basement, looking at the perfect model of their town. It's not really big enough. There were others, but there wasn't enough work. She laughs a little and says, we're living in a one locksmith town. And there's barely enough work for me. A lot of the new buildings have gone electric, using cards, no keys. My place is a bit more old-fashioned. I'll be waiting at the gate to let you in. She hangs up, saving him from saying there's no need to wait outside. The ride over is uneventful. He's sure to stare straight ahead to avoid any potential diversions. He passes houses and apartments, places he was recently. There are people he'd like to check up on just to see how they're sleeping, if their expressions have changed. He wonders this, if Mrs. Alina Markins of 127 Rockcliffe Road is happier now that she's buried her husband. Did she use the key he made for her to the garage where the bastard kept his navy blue 1972, 1972 Citroen locked away so she couldn't drive it? Has she removed the car cover and taken that car for a ride? He hopes so. He imagines her speeding, the windows down, a big smile on her face, a whole new kind of freedom in front of her and that lousy bastard six feet under. He hopes many things as he rides in the direction of the small community college. Can't help but wonder what is going on behind the closed doors. All the houses and the apartments, the offices where lights still burn. He needs to know. So many of the cards require updating. He parks his motorbike and secures the wheel lock. She's waiting at the gate, but comes towards him with that unmistakable waddling, almost limp, when she sees the sidecar. That is fabulous, she says. I didn't think people had these anymore. He takes off his helmet. She watches him retrieve his gear from the sidecar's trunk. It's not for a passenger, she asks. It's my mobile workshop. If I take some stuff out, a person can sit in there. Need some help carrying anything. I got it, he says. Hey, it's you from speed dating last night. The guy who loves basements. He gestures towards the gate with his pick set. Shall we? As they walk, she says, I'm so glad you're here. I've just been freaking out. I've never lost my keys before. Never. The gate clangs shut. They must have fallen out of my pocket at some point today. I even retraced my steps. And I went to the police station. She holds the ground floor door open for him. Thank you. The police were completely useless. And they had nothing to do. They were just sitting around. Looks like there's no crime in this town. Not much. Makes you wonder why anybody would need to lock their doors, she says, leading the way up the stairs. I just moved here from a big city. It's been a shock. Do you like it here? It's all right. I grew up in a small town, but I was always trying to escape from that place. It's the circumstances that brought me here that were crap. Oh. Yeah, she says. Their voice trailing off. Inside the apartment, she closes the door.
early as stone Valley of change Out here in this concrete wasteland Trying desperately to get back to you Get on back to you. And the grasses were high here once. Coming out of the humid But all that's left are these petrified blades and as i'm a crawling i'm a bleeding just trying to get back to you get on back to you to this wilderness only to drop like flies we were just trying desperately to get back to Would you like something to drink? As he knows she can only offer water, he says, I think it's best I do my work quickly and let you go to sleep. Your basement calling? She smiles rather grimly. So that's your art, making keys. Part of it, yes. What's the other part? On the kitchen counter, he sees a key ring with three keys. Are those for the apartment? Yes. If you let me take them... I'll bring them back first thing in the morning. Okay. I leave the house at around eight. Can you make that? What other keys do you need? She lets out a frustrated sigh. It's like I said on the phone. They were singles. I can't replace them. Can you show me the locks? How will that help? He takes the pen-sized camera from his shirt pocket. I can make a photo of the inside of the lock with this. 
At my workshop, workshop, I've got special software which can create a digital reproduction of the key based on the lock. Then it's just a matter of making the key. You can do that, she asks. There's software for that. There's software for pretty much everything these days. Yes, right. There is. She moves closer to inspect the camera. Looks a, like a little flashlight. It's a camera. She stares at it. Think about what you can do with it. It only works for very simple locks, he says. She leads him through the small, sparsely furnished apartment. He goes through the motions of photographing the lock of her desk drawer, the secu security box hidden beneath her shoes in the closet, and the diary by her bed. Can you show me the photos? She asked, following him to the door. I want to see how, how this works. It's not that fancy. He gathers up his gear. I'll be here tomorrow at eight sharp. Sleep well. The door closes behind him. He hears the chain slide into place. Back in his basement, the work is done quickly. He copies her keys the old-fashioned way, like for like. It's easy to do with the originals. He opens the top of House B and lifts out the small rack of keys. He removes Madeline Swain's keys and puts the new set in its place with a red label on the key to the apartment door. Swain's card is also removed from the catalogue. He writes a date on the card's bottom right-hand corner and puts the card and keys into a sealable plastic bag. He leaves the bag on the workbench to be filed later and slides a blank card into his shirt pocket. It takes a good 10 minutes of rifling through his boxes of key rings to find something he deems appropriate. It's a small black die with a metal loop on the one side. He manoeuvres the keys onto this ring, hoping she'll like it. At 1.47am, he's back in her apartment. She's in bed this time, with the red rug thrown over the top. She's sleeping on her stomach, rather twisted. Her left leg is pulled up, the knee bent at 90 degrees, and she has her left cheek on the pillow. Her hair is tucked under a kind of woven hat, he assumes this, along with the shampoo in the bathroom, is for the dandruff. He watches her sleep for a while. She changes position often and is restless and twitchy. At one point, she takes her hat off and throws it aside. It lands at his feet. He wonders if the dandruff is a result of stress. The new keys work. He opens her diary and reads it, using the light from his pen-sized camera. The security box has a few trinkets from her childhood, as well as a handgun, some photographs, a few police reports, and a bundle of letters that are of little interest. A boyfriend who appears to have broken her heart during their screwed up junkie romance. The desk drawer is filled with business stuff, confirming the contents of the diary. He takes the card from his shirt pocket and writes, House B, third floor, front left side, Sophia Wilkes, single, Broke, BA in social anthropology, but thrown out of university for falsifying her thesis. Estranged from parents, academics, as a result. Reformed drug addict, three months clean. Possibly a compulsive liar. Says she's a soft she sells software, but is actually a cashier slash receptionist at the Siberia Internet Cafe. Confesses everything in her diary, but lies in real life. Now in small town, trying to start again. Another candidate for reinvention? or a new, new identity, deserves sympathy to a certain point, sleeps awkwardly as if subconscious is trying to solve problems, perhaps reliving mistakes or wanting to go back in time to do things differently, scratches at arms and neck during sleep, has bad dandruff. He pockets the card, wondering how he can help her. She's now sleeping on her back, knees bent, the red rug, a perfect pyramid. He edges out of the room, and leaves the apartment.
cradled in an empty vault. The hearts of Santa Maria Looking in the shadows The streets below Where the red light flickers in the dust She brushing a tangled hair The moonlight falls down her naked breast in the soft spring air Ring the bell Oh, Josephine Ring the bell Now it's well past the midnight hour Times those twisted stairs He's staring up at the bread and the wine Floating above the altar And when she slips off that silken dress There's a laughter about the pews He takes her into his lumber and arms like a lamb to slaughter Ring the bell Oh, just a fact Ring the bell And all these earthly things have come to pass All these earthly things will fail and all these earthly things come to pass All these earthly things will fade So ring the bell Oh, just a fad Ring the bell And when your heart's torn open and your hands are pressed against the heavens Oh, come on down to the valley of love And when your heart's torn open And your hands are pressed against the heavens Oh, come on down to the valley She can't pay, but offers to make him dinner instead. He refuses at first, but accepts after her playful pressing becomes aggressive, because he would also like to learn a bit more about her, which is why he is now sitting in her apartment. The fold-out table has two chairs, mismatched. He has decided the dinner and any possible dessert is a financial agreement for her, a bill she can't cover, she can cover without money. She makes rice with vegetables and tofu, it's rather plain and mostly rice. She offers him salt and pepper and the shakers look like they were lifted from a, from a restaurant. The salt shaker has small grains of rice inside. He doesn't really know what to say. He eats. She talks. She asks questions about the town and the residents. She remarks that the town is rather affluent with low crime and little poverty. She tells the story again of going to the police station to report her lost keys. They were adamant that if someone finds the keys, that person will hand them in. Come on, Will, do people really do that here? Sure. Why not? She shakes her head a little in disbelief. Totally unexpected. In the world these days, people are always trying to take advantage of you. They look at you thinking only about what they can get from you. Maybe they're thinking more about what they can offer, he says, like this very nice dinner. Sorry, it's a bit dull. I'm still stocking up my kitchen with goodies. Why did you move here? You don't seem to like it. I just need to get settled, to find my rhythm. 
Maybe first you should find your keys. She laughs at this and it comes across as forced. That's funny. I didn't expect you to be funny, Will. At speed darting, you struck me as a bit strange, like you were hiding something, but you're totally normal. You work, you do your art in your basement. I still want to see some of that. You already did. Your new keys. Her look is quizzical. You think that's art? Yes. A kind of sculpting. Still life with lock with key and lock. He puts down his fork. The art is in the precision, making a key that perfectly fits the lock. And you don't have to jiggle it or have a special feel. The key goes in and it works every time. He sits back, folds his arms and adds, people think all keys look the same or are similar, but even keys that look identical have minuscule differences. And it's these differences that mean a key will work or not. Fascinating. Can you pick locks as well? A lot of my work is helping people get into places they're locked out of. Show me. I don't have my pick set. You need the right tools. Can't you do that with a credit card, she asks. Slide it between the door and the frame. That's what you see in movies. It doesn't work in real life. You always end up snapping the card in half. She points at him with her fork. I won't believe you until you hear me. The same goes with that basement of yours. I don't know. Get some stuff from your sidecar. Have you got a pit sack, pick set in there? He nods. Go get it. I'm not sure about this. Go get it. Then more calmly. My neighbor from across the hall is on holiday. We can pick her lock. She stands up to open the door for him. I want you to show me how it's done right now. Think of it as a little pre-dessert entertainment. He decides to do what she says. Down at his motorbike, he briefly considers riding home, but something impels him back upstairs, pick set in hand. He doesn't want any of her desserts, but he does want her to accept that what he does is art. He's getting the feeling she's not right for this town. She's waiting at the top of her stairs. When he sees her closed door, she holds up her keys, the ring with the small black die, and says, I'm prepared, don't worry. He takes his time picking the lock to show it's more complicated than it looks. He thinks about Valerie Charlesworth, divorcee, resident of House B, third floor, front right side. She works in admin at the community college. Her husband was having an affair with Cornelia Connie Bracken of House D, second floor, back left side, until the situation was contrived for Valerie to find out about it and kick her deadbeat unemployed husband out. The cards on Cornelia Bracken and Bernie Charlesworth received final dating and filing a few months ago. As the door clicks open, he wonders if Valerie has taken that holiday to Scandinavia she always dreamed of taking. He'd left some brochures in her mailbox when he'd last visited. He'd found her sleeping well, spread eagled in the big bed, glad to be rid of her baggage. You did it, she says, pushing past him. We're in. Come back, he whispers. You can't go in there. Relax, Will. No one's home. She grabs his arm and pulls him inside. So I took the lowly tow bar, the brick and sin, up to the market square. Did not have a penny, just a pack of smokes. Traded in for a bagel or a beer, or take it slowly, my dear. Take it slowly, 
whispered in my ear. Instead, I huddled in my coat nearby, all the cheese and choke, and tried to breathe them in. Watched around the corner, jewels about her every quarter as a breath. So it rise and fall and take it slowly, my dear. Take it slowly, whispered in my ear. And is back under the bridge I go. Oh, back under the bridge I know. Oh, And is back under the bridge I go, oh, back under the bridge I know. Oh, oh, oh. So I took the lowly towpath, brick and sin, up to the market square. Did not have a penny, I had one last smoke, so I took it by the laundry clear. I take it slowly, my dear. But I did not have a light, so I asked those breaths all right and vinced her in for a little back. Cut a supple chest. Stopped her in the dry dress, I wrote a poem on the tilt-out wall, said, take it slowly, my dear, take it slowly, whispered in my ear, and it's back under the bridge I go, oh, back under the bridge I know, oh, And it's back under the bridge I go, back under the bridge I know. Don't touch anything, he says, closing the door. In the open plan kitchen and living room, she goes to the kitchen first opening the cupboards and taking things out. We should have had dinner here, she says. Look at all this good stuff. Put that back. She's holding a bottle of wine in her hands, looking around for a corkscrew. She won't notice. Please, put it back. She does so, saying, you're really not much fun. She moves through the apartment some more, opening drawers and looking at the books on the shelf. Now that she's out of the kitchen, he stopped worrying that she might find the coffee container in the fridge, the one that Valerie fills with money because she doesn't trust banks. Come here, she says. She's standing on the rug in the living room. He once sat on that rug, cross-legged, while Bernie and Valerie were asleep and looked, at, looked through their photo albums. He skimmed through the rejection letters Bernie had received. He read the first few chapters of the novel Bernie was writing, scrawled by hand and about a professional killer named Oscar, who gets hired by powerful Hollywood types to kill celebrities and famous people in order to raise the awareness of that person's brand. Death resulted in increased fame and attention and allowed for back catalogues of work to be re-released, making the star more profitable and famous in death than they were in life. The novel was interesting enough that he delayed outing the affair of Bernie and Cornelia so he could keep reading the chapters and find out what happened to Oscar. But Bernie stopped writing, and Oscar's unfinished story tormented him. He desperately needed an ending, and Bernie couldn't give him one, not even under torture. Come here, she orders. I think we should leave. I think you should come over here, she points at the rug. Right now, he does so, dragging his feet like a child in trouble. She pushes, pushes him down onto the rug and sits on top of him. What are you doing? She's got his belt open and his fly down and is aggressively getting hold. She kisses him a few times, but not on the lips. He struggles, but not very hard. And she's surprisingly strong in the hips. Despite himself, his body responds and she gets a position she wants. Soon, he can feel the rug moving just slightly underneath him, powered by her gyrations. She seems to really enjoy it, the way an addict might be desperate for a fix and then gets it. 
and it's more about scratching the itch, the itch than the pleasure it brings. Her hair comes loose from her ponytail and a few flakes of dandruff waft down. <laughs> oh, man. <sighs> he lets himself get used, hoping it will all be over soon. He doesn't know what to do with his hands. She solves this issue by grabbing his wrists and pinning his hands to it behind his head. This gives her more purchase and she really rides him, her hands pressing his wrists so hard she can, he can feel the blood being cut off. Not so loud, he says. Shut up, I'm almost there. The rug is edging towards the sofa. For distraction, he tracks its progress. He's starting to get sore and is now praying for it to be over. Millimetre by millimetre, shout after shout. He braces himself for the final stretch. Then she collapses on him. He blows a few strands of hair out of his mouth. Her grip lessens and he moves his fingers a little to get the blood going again. Oh, I needed that, she says, standing up quickly and leaving him on the rug. She duck walks to the kitchen and takes a carton of milk from the fridge. She drinks it straight from the carton, finishing it tipping it vertically and shaking it so the last drops hit her tongue. He wants to go home, to take a long shower and change his clothes. On his feet, with his pants up and belt secured, he sees his body has left a slight indentation in the rug, as a man might if he fell on it from ten stories. He watches her poke in the fridge. She opens a box of chocolates and eats a few. She spits out one she doesn't like. Oh, cherry! When he, when he gets to the kitchen... She's got the coffee container in her hands. She pops the lid off and looks inside. Oh, jackpot! She takes out the cylinders of notes, tightly bound by elastic bands. Put that back, he says. Look at all this money, Will. You have no idea how much I could use this. He reaches to grab the container, but she pulls it back. What do you think you're doing? Get away from me. Just put the container back in the fridge and let's go. She shakes her head, causing a flurry of dandruff. This is mine now, she shouts. I found it. It's mine. She backs out of the kitchen and he chases after her. She's rather nimble and manages to elude his grasp. As they do a few laps of the living room and kitchen, she uses the furniture to keep him at a distance, fainting this way, then that, dodging like an expert. She throws stuff at him, books, magazines, a candlestick, all the while clutching the coffee container, container to her chest. When she tries for the door, he's right behind her and pushes her head against the door with enough force to render her unconscious. She collapses to the floor. Sitting in the morning black on an ice stock pollard bench with a green apple in his head. Yeah. And he's got into its supple flesh with a silver ridge standing knife, writing the words death over and over. Again, and all the people walking by, they're all whispering that he has got the white chapel blue. And down on the station floor, next to the marble pier, is tent of the poor. Stands an officer of the law And he's looking for a man Said to be eight foot tall with a red right hand But he knows better than to listen to strange urban men So he lights up a cigarette 
And he smokes, oh, yes, he smokes the White Chapel Blues. And over in a small terrace flat, beside the scrapers and the vapors and the bats, Kathy takes out a cotton dress she'll be wearing this evening. And it's long and it's laced and it's wide It smells of semen sold it's soap in the night Oh, why can't people just be happy again? She zips up the seat Oh, so tired and takes on her white chapel blue And underneath the tar, where all the lines and all those little things are, the maggots and the millipedes, they come out to play. And they're looking for something rotten to eat. Something to mince and to mash and to turn into heat But all the ice and concrete just gets up in their little non-existent eyes Ah, oh, but they squidge and they squirm Toward the surface, oh They and they squirm to the white chapel blue Out of the shower and in fresh clothes, he goes downstairs to the basement. She's still out, which is good, but also a worry. He has little experience with tranquilizers when it comes to humans. Peculiarly in the chair, her arms strapped down, her ankles duct taped together. She has a pulse. He lifts her chin to look at her. There's no grimace, no grinding of teeth. She looks rather content. Her face isn't showing any signs of struggle or fear. She has no expression at all. She's peaceful. He puts on some latex gloves and goes to the large medicine cabinet. The heroin is located on the shelf labelled F to J. He takes a few needles as well, an unused teaspoon and a short length of rubber hose. All the marks are on the inside of her left elbow, so he ties a tourniquet around her left arm and taps at the skin with two fingers. The veins are thin. He heats up what he deems to be the right amount of heroin and fills a needle with the bubbly, almost caramelised liquid. The smell seems to rouse her, and she comes to just the drug into her vein. Her eyes glazed and drooping. He looks down. She looks down at the needle in her left arm and smiles. Hey. Oh, thank you, she says. You're welcome. A bit more awake now, she fights against the strapping around her wrists, and her eyes dart around the basement. But then, the, and then she goes limp in the chair. Where am I? You're in my basement. He places the needle, spoon and tourniquet on the bench to be used again later. She stares at the model of the town, at all the perfectly arranged cardboard houses and symmetrical streets. She leans to the right side of the chair and turns her head to get a better look. What's that? She asks. It's the town. You made this? Yes. That's wild, she laughs. Oh, miss this. He goes to the northern end of the model and opens up the top of a cardboard building. He lifts out a rack of keys. I've got every building, house, apartment, garage, you name it, he says. These are the current keys, but I've also got all the keys of every resident dating back 23 years to when I started. I've kept a record of everyone. She finds this hysterical. Her laughter echoes in the basement. Stop laughing. This is, this is very serious. A lifetime project. But why? I wanted to know about the people. I wanted to help them. I grew up in this town and it wasn't always as nice as it is now. You think you're responsible for that? Yes. You and your magic keys. She starts crying a little. How are you going to help me? You're beyond helping, he says flatly. 
Mm, get me high and dump me in a river. She looks at the model again, with its blue section snaking through the town, signifying the river and the small trees lining its banks. This is beautiful, she says. I know. This is the art you were talking about. He nods. You stole my keys. I did. You broke into my apartment. Yes, I watched you sleeping. What? I watched you sleeping. You were so unhappy. So many problems, but you don't have to worry about anything. It's over. She laughs a little. I think that just might be a voice in my head, she says. I'm not going to die. None of this is real. Your model is too beautiful to be real. Well, that's very nice of you to say, but... I don't want to do more than think of the negative uses for keys. Unlock the secrets. Let the skeleton out of the closet. Then, through gritted teeth, everybody's hiding something. Where's the money, Will? I want my money. I don't have any money. Neither do you. Their breathing is shallow. Always the same. Always the goddamn same. He ties the tourniquet around her arm again. She doesn't resist. The look in her eyes is one of encouragement. Impatient almost. He does the work, filling her with a large amount of the drug. That'll do it, Will, she says, smiling. What now? She passes out. He releases the tourniquet and puts it in the sealable plastic bag together with a needle spoon and a couple of small packages of heroin. The bag goes in the inside pocket of his coat together with the pick set. He cuts the duct tape and removes it from her ankles and gets the strapping loose. Carrying her upstairs... He thinks she's lighter than before. There's almost no traffic as he rides to her apartment. Halfway there, she sits up, finding herself in the sidecar and speeding along the empty streets. The wind blows her hair back and she opens her mouth widely to let out a long, joyous whoop. Then she passes out again. He stops to buy a carton of milk and a box of chocolates. Her apartment complex and carries her upstairs. He decides to put her in the bath, smiling all the while. He, he leaves the tourniquet tied around her arm and places the blackened spoon on the floor. A string of white foam dribbles out of the corner of her mouth. He uses her keys to open the desk drawer in the security box. The gun goes on the bathroom floor within arm's reach. It's a grisly scene and he's not terribly proud of his handiwork but it had to be done. He leaves the lights on. He washes the plate and glass he used, the cutlery as well, and puts it all away. With door just slightly ajar, he deftly slides the chain into place with a specially fashioned screwdriver, pulls the door shut. In Valerie's apartment, a carton of milk and box shelf at the very back where it always sits. Tossed you in a tiny bowl And that feels all Some pray to their fathers, and some and my sweet Emery. Take me from this sailing fight, cause it feels hollow. And when old Billy Tyler he creeps up to your bed and a a whisper in there and says forget about a lad she will fuck all the lads oh she won't hold out for you that feels hollow
Yes, I will hold, hold out. Oh, I will hold out. Yes, I will hold out. Oh, I will hold out. Oh, yes, I will hold out. Oh, yes, I will hold out. Thank you, Joseph. That was wonderful. Thank you for count? all the tunes. <laughs> Thanks for the uh, really dark story. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of weird when you're reading it because there's some parts in there that I find really funny and um, it's hard to keep a straight face yeah. for some of it. But um, we really hope you enjoyed it. I, I really enjoyed reading the story and I really enjoyed uh, listening to Joseph's music as well. So I think it uh, came together quite nicely. Yes, thank you everybody for listening absolutely and um oh you go on. yeah i was going to say that uh you know in times like this we're, we're in lockdown hamburg at the moment or lockdown light whatever they want to call it however they brand it um you know art and music and books it's so important at these times to help people through and to stay positive even when it's a dark story there's a <laughs> he, he thinks he's doing the right thing um <laughs> is that these, these are things that we need to enjoy and we need to support artists and support musicians as well. Without darkness, there can be no light. That's true. should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to leave the inspirational quotes to uh, Cam. Well, you think I'm a writer or something? Uh, um, no, he's right. So please um, donate if you enjoy the shows. Please donate. Uh, watch the other shows as well from September, October. They're great. There's another one coming up in December and also in January and February. Ken, uh, oh, sorry, Ken. Uh, can you tell us a little, about, a little bit about who we're don donating to? Today? Absolutely. Yes. Oh, you want me to do that? Yeah, okay. Well, I thought I, did, I thought I did this at the start, but I'll do it again. No, we, we, um, we, didn't, we didn't do it. No? no. So shame on me. Um, we are – all of the events are for donations for the Indige Indigenous Literacy Foundation. Um, the link is in the description of the YouTube channel. And on so, Instagram, it's in my bio. It's Instagram is still on. I don't know whether it is or not. It cut out halfway through. Um, wonderful. Dreams. Actual dreams. Uh, somebody's watching somewhere. Um, we've already raised nearly 500 euros. So it's been a great success so far. And we really want the event to continue. It's a wonderful cause, um, helping Indigenous Australians to get access to books in remote areas and also children learning how to read. It's a wonderful thing. Nice. And on that note. What do you want me to oh, say? Oh, I thought you were going to give me a note. On that note. No, no. On that note. Uh, ping. Um, <laughs> um, yes. Eilis Froley and Steph Grace will be the December event. So yes. please tune in Make second sure Saturday of December. Tune in. Steph is a... Good mate of mine, so uh, she's boss. She's a legend. 
Excellent. Stay healthy, everyone. Ciao for now.